As an American living very close to Paris, I recently read Ernest Hemingway's classic, A Movable Feast. This book is Hemingway's memoirs of his life in Paris as a young man in the 1920s. Amidst the familiar Parisian backdrop, Hemingway recounts memorable moments from his youth, bumping shoulders with the foreign literary circle of the likes of F. Scott Fitzgerald and James Joyce. I had heard of Hemingway many times, but was intimidated by the famous name and figured it would be hard to read. What pushed me to read A Movable Feast was my need for escapism and my curiosity to learn how a famous author saw this city nearly a century ago. Reading Hemingway as a young American man in Paris myself, I was surprised at my reaction to the book. To clarify, I'm American, but I grew up in France from ages 13 to 18. On top of that, I've lived in the Paris area for several years, so the city's romanticism had faded for me, and I took it for granted. When I returned to France as a master's student in 2018, I had limited funds, and I was too old to qualify for student discounts that would have allowed me to access museums for free, so I kind of resented Paris because I couldn't fully enjoy all it had to offer. After graduating, the job market was tough, so I ended up working at a call center for a few months. Reading Hemingway changed my perspective on my situation. After a few years as a newspaper editor for the Toronto Star, Hemingway decided to give up his day job and become a full-time author. During this time, he didn't have much money or food. In the book, he mentions deliberately taking a certain path to avoid being tempted by food. Hemingway thought that hunger made him think more clearly and be more appreciative of art. I guess he didn't become hangry like some people. In my case, I was able to avoid being hangry and hungry thanks to the Crew Student Restaurant. Still, I remember walking past the elegant cafes on the Boulevard Saint-Germain and trying to ignore them because I knew I couldn't afford to eat there. Anyway, what this book really showed me is that there's so much to appreciate just by being in Paris. He underscores this at the end of the book when he summarizes his first years in Paris, saying, This is how Paris was in the early days, when we were very poor and very happy. Feeling inspired by a movable feast, I decided to visit some of the places where Hemingway roamed for myself. I first went to his apartment at 71 Rue Cardinal Le Monde, next to the lovely village-like atmosphere of the Place de la Contrescarpe. Then I walked down the Rue Cardinal Le Monde to the Ile Saint-Louis, passing by the Seine River. It felt invigorating to see this familiar city in a new light. It goes without saying that Paris has a much deeper history than some American author in the early 20th century. In any case, Hemingway resonated with me and got me started on this journey of appreciation. Next, I paid a visit to the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, which is located very close to Notre Dame. In Hemingway's day, it was actually located somewhere else. This bookstore is an excellent place to find the latest and greatest English language books in Paris. The only downside is that you'll pay a premium for their excellent curation. I ended up buying a book called Walks in Hemingway's Paris to help me find some key places from a movable feast. Of course, we are currently in the third confinement, so the bars, restaurants, and cafes of Hemingway's days are currently closed. Living in these unusual times, I think it's essential to enjoy the freedom that we do have to walk within 10 kilometers of our home. I know many of you around the world are itching at the chance to come to Paris again. For the time being, I hope this video can satisfy your wanderlust. So next, I biked to Hemingway's haunts around the Boulevard Montparnasse and the Jardin de Luxembourg. Despite the closures, I wanted to see the places for myself. I went to see the Dôme and the Rotonde cafés, which are across the street from each other. The Rotonde was boarded up, and the Dôme was empty except perhaps for the ghosts of past patrons. It was a depressing reminder that Paris's café culture is on pause until further notice. Of course it's necessary, since intensive care units are quickly being overwhelmed. Still, I hope to somehow capture the magic of Hemingway's Paris. A few blocks away, I tried to find Hemingway's second apartment at 113 Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs. 
I was a bit confused because I saw 111 and I saw 115, but there was no 113. I'm not really sure whether there's a 113 hidden behind or if it was demolished. I guess for now it'll remain a mystery. In any case, here's a picture of Hemingway in front of the building in 1924. From there, I walked to the Closerie des Lilas, which Hemingway once called one of the finest cafes in Paris, and where he often worked in the mornings. While it is currently closed, you can see how the lush greenery surrounding the cafe would create a calm working environment. In front of the cafe sits the statue of the Maréchal de Ney, who was a marshal killed in Napoleon's Russia campaign. Hemingway would often sit on the cafe terrace to keep the statue company. From there, I walked to the Jardin de Luxembourg. This famous park was gorgeous on such a sunny day, and lots of people were out soaking up the sun. Hemingway would often walk through the park, as there was no food there to tempt him. With an empty stomach, he would admire the art by Impressionists at the Musée de Luxembourg. Today, most of this art has been moved to the Musée d'Orsay. Given the 7 p.m. curfew now in place, I decided to call it a day. The next day, I went to Saint-Germain-des-Prés, where Hemingway first stayed when he came to Paris. Funnily enough, this area is where my grad school is located. So my first year in Paris, I spent a lot of time around here. I must have passed by the Café de Fleurs, the Café de Magot, and the Brasserie Lippe hundreds of times on my way to class. Hemingway regularly frequented these spots for a drink with friends, to people watch, or to grab a beer in some Alsatian cuisine at the Brasserie Lippe. Many famous intellectuals also frequented these cafés, such as Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and Picasso. Today, the Café de Fleurs is empty, except for some stacked chairs. The De Magos' only occupants are some giant teddy bears, which seem to be a hit with local passerby. The lack of tourists in the past year has been an odd change to the Parisian cityscape. Now that spring has sprung in Paris, the thousands of tourists crowding major sites in the banks of the Seine have been replaced with Parisians themselves. If you have the chance to come to Paris for the next few years, especially if you're already familiar with the major tourist sites, I really encourage you to read A Movable Feast. After reading Hemingway's book, visiting the places in person really brought his story to life. I discovered a new side of the city and realized there's so much more I have to learn. Still, the contrast between Hemingway's Paris and today's Paris could not be starker. As a Frenchified American living in a Paris without bars, cafes, or restaurants, Hemingway's book really helped me find meaning in difficult times. Paris may be under lockdown, but I know that as soon as it is safe, this ancient city will come roaring back to life. I can't wait to sit down at a cafe again and enjoy Parisian life to the fullest.